Welcome to Climate Change The Facts 2020 interview series brought to you by the Institute of Public Affairs, Australia's leading voice for freedom and hosted by me, Joe Nova. Climate Change The Facts 2020 is the fourth edition in the Institute of Public Affairs Climate Change The Facts series. You can purchase a copy of this hugely popular book online at climatechangethefacts.org.au. Welcome to another interview with, and this time we've got the Professor Emeritus at the University of Tasmania. We've got Angsie Kello to talk to us. He's Professor of, uh, Emeritus Professor of Government. So, and Angsie, that's a very, uh, well, it's an unusual background coming in a science debate. So maybe we could start with you describing your, your path to coming here to dis discussing the issues we have with science at the moment being used for policy or in this case policy being used to make science and how you arrived at this strange point in the road. Yes. Yeah, thanks Joe. I'm, I'm a, an environmental policy specialist but I come by way of uh, a kind of science background uh, both at school and in my first years at university. Uh, I was uh, initially a medical student, so I had to do first year physics, chemistry, zoology to get into medical school, got into medical school and didn't much like it, um, and sort of dropped out, leaving behind a research scholarship looking at the postnatal changes of the ductus arteriosus and rabbits, of which I was the only world expert at the time. Um, but that carried through into a, a, an honours thesis and a PhD on environmental politics and policy. And... Um, uh, also, you know, that kind of landed me in some questions of kind of risk assessment, risk management, uh, particularly in the 1990s um, and uh, some involvement in the OECD looking at risk management and, you know, published a book on that and then, then one on called Science and Public Policy, uh, The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Science. Um, so, you know, I look at the, the use of science uh, and it's, it's the way it finds its way into public policy and to some extent the way scientific information doesn't find its way into public policy and the pitfalls associated with that. Um, so um, my it journey... sounds like the perfect background. You've got the, the full spectrum of the hard and soft sciences, a bit of medicine thrown in. And yeah. then you've moved on to do the environmental, the policy making, the research, and the PhD. A good combo then to comment yeah, can, on such I, a I big topic. I can understand. I can under, sort of understand enough science. Um, I, I don't understand enough science to be able to do it, but I can, you know, look at it and see what's wrong with it, and and you know what some of the faults are, uh, and look at scientific controversies and debates and. Uh, and celebrate those because, you know, science, as we know, is, is a contested enterprise. Well, it should start be my, contested. <laughs> I start my chapter with a quote from Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner, saying that science is a belief in the ignorance of experts. And unless, you know, unless you do question the experts and, and encourage disagreements that might exist between experts, then you don't really have a scientific process because the, the process of science, well, science is a is more of a process than an outcome. Well, uh, yes, and that is, I mean, I've, as I said years ago in the Skeptics Handbook, we're talking about the issues, the, the problems we have is that it's monopoly, it's a monopsonistic-based monop science. There's only one buyer, meaning the government, yeah. and we don't have competition anymore in some of these policies because there's literally no sort of private funding for some of these environmental topics. It's mm. all controlled by the government. Yeah. And then what we end up with is the incentives on our researchers is almost purely to perform for the government. And that also means to perform for getting grants. Yeah. So, well, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you can point to philosophers of science like, like Karl Popper, who mm -hmm. emphasised that you really needed a, a liberalism. He was a, an advocate of political liberalism, but very much an advocate of liberalism in science as well, that, that uh, we should only adhere to hypotheses tentatively pending uh, their survival of repeated attempts at falsification. Now, if you have a political system, a political process that kind of shouts off and closes off attempts at falsification, then you're losing you know, something of science. And uh, I must say, I was fortunate 
at Otago to be in, a, in a, an arts faculty that included some great philosophers of science, including uh, um, Alan Musgrave, who'd worked with him, Lakatosh, and you know, there were visitors like Popper in the 70s when I was a graduate student there. Yeah, and the uh, idea and of falsifiability being at the core of what it yeah. is to have a science theory. And if it can't be falsified, we're not talking about science, but something else. And you have a great quote in there. I think it was in regard to Warwick Hughes and one of the researchers oh, when yes. Warwick asked for the data. Yeah, he asked for, you know, the raw data for the, uh, the Hadcrete uh, temperature record, uh, which um, doesn't, uh, I think existence entirety because they moved to a new server and needed more uh, more memory and, and threw some of it away. Uh, but the answer he got uh, was, uh, you know, why should we provide you with our, our data when all you want to do is find something wrong with it? Now, of course, finding something wrong with something is inherently scientific. That's that lies. It is the, the whole the point, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they, they so neatly captured what isn't science and how far yeah. climate research has come from being a yeah. science. Yeah. And, and, and instead, you know, there is a problem anyway with the scientific literature. I mean, people have written on the fact that it's very hard to get negative results published uh, in journals and academic journals. And yet, you know, if you follow Popper, uh, that's an inherent part of the scientific process. You know, if you can't get a, a negative result into, into the literature, then science has problems and climate, climate science particularly has those sorts of problems in spades, particularly when you look at, and I canvassed some of this in the, in the chapter, the um, climate gate emails, where the participants in those exchanges are frequently talking about, you know, in, in one case, uh, I can't quote it uh, verbatim, but let's, this, this won't find its way into the next IPCC report, uh, even if we have to redefine what uh, peer-reviewed science is. And, and that is part of the problem, isn't it? The yeah, peer-reviewed yeah. science itself is two anonymous power reviews a lot of the time where researchers are even asked who they want to interview Yes. Their, yeah. Who they want to read their work and review their work. I mean, and, and as you point out, it should be double blind, not just single blind, but double blind. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was surprised. One of the things I published on risk, and this related to uh, GMOs, uh, in a journal in the US, the editor asked me to nominate the referees. Now, I have never until then and not since encountered in the social science uh, journals an editor asking me to nominate referees. Yeah, it's uh, effectively the editor saying to someone, so who do you think is going to like your work and yeah, give us their yeah. name and number? <laughs> yeah. and, again, the, and again, the climate gate emails, you know, reveal things like, you know, editors saying, I need another negative review to go with the one I've already got so that I can refuse to publish this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you know, so the quality assurance process is that we count on in science just aren't there. It is. It turns into Pell Review. And as I say in the, in the chapter, unfortunately, globalisation has weakened that anonymous peer review process. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, um, articles would be sent, draft articles would be sent to referees in, in different parts of the world often, uh, quite remote. It was expensive to even make a phone call. It was expensive until the jumbo jet came along. Mm. You know, we, we ignore two important aspects of globalization, the jumbo jet and containerized shipping. Uh, it's not just information, but in this case, um, they all know each other. They're all in contact by email. They come together for conferences. And the IPCC, in a sense, exacerbated that because it brings scientists from uh, the same sort of area and puts them into contact with each other. So Very the, much the, so. And having yeah. been to one of those events, I can attest to how enormous they are. A lot of people don't realise the Olympic size of these IPCC conferences. We're talking about gatherings. The one I was at in Bali was 12,000 people for two entire weeks. I yeah. mean, these are the Olympics of conferences and yeah. I think they're and the annual. So it's a rock star kind of status amongst the climate researchers in the science world, it doesn't get better than being invited to two week conferences in often tropical locations with all mm. your best friends. Mm. Mm. I was, uh, I must say, I was before I was, I mean, I acted as a, uh, 
uh, an expert reviewer for the um, uh, the fourth uh, um, assessment report. Uh, but I'd been invited uh, in the 90s to attend one, uh, one of these working group meetings. But of course, uh, I couldn't. I had teaching responsibilities at the time. And so what you tend to get by way of participation also are not university scientists, scientists who have, or experts who have teaching to do, but people in specialist research institutes whose, whose very existence and budgets depend on uh, servicing this need, this call for science related to climate change. Now, you know, some of those people, I'm sure, if they really thought there wasn't a, a problem to the extent uh, which uh, many uh, suggest, might say so and, and, and take a different position. But there are plenty of examples, I think, of, if you like, a kind of uh, what Ian Bowl, a, a sociologist of science, referred to as a value slope that kind of favours particular outcomes. And so kind of, you know, things go more easily if they slide down that slope in a particular direction and pushing it uphill <laughs> to kind of uh, extend that metaphor becomes more difficult and, uh, and a lot of people don't try. No, I mean, it almost looks like to me climate science was barely ever in the real realm of science, it may have started out that way in the 60s to 80s. And, you know, we still have the yeah. sorts like Richard Lindzen from the very beginnings and, and Garth Paltridge, who mm -hmm. uh, you, I believe you know, and because you write yeah. about Garth and his experience. And at that point, that paper that Garth put out in 2009 about yeah. humidity, just so the audience understands, is, is a, a critical scientific uh, paper in terms of whether CO2 is going to be a disaster for us yeah. because Garth was looking at the upper atmosphere and looking at, at humidity levels up there. Now, this is not, it, it's bigger than CO2 because in understanding the science of how this works, the uh, humidity up at that height is meant in all the models to amplify the warming. Mm -hmm. And so Garth was looking at probably the most critical data set yeah. And yet, as you write, he had so much trouble getting this into print. And, uh, I mean, I quote his 2009 paper all the time. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, from your point of view then, and I don't know if you want to expand so the audience understands just what was so difficult about what Garth had to do and what he went through so yeah. people outside science can get an understanding of what is meant to happen and what didn't happen in his case. Well, they looked at all the available weather balloon data uh, and uh, um, said, and, you know, Garth is old school science, and he said, if the data are accurate, and, you know, said if, made it quite clear, uh, then the, um, the uh, record since about 1950, which is when the global data is available from, uh, indicated that if anything, there was a, probably a negative feedback um, mm. from water vapour. Now, they sent that off, I think it was the Journal of Climate that had, as an editor, the leader of the Green Party in British Columbia, <laughs> who, I don't know who he sent it to review for, but one of the yeah, reviewers came Andrew back. Andrew Weaver, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Incredible that he, he was, yeah. Yeah. I, I must admit, I didn't realise that until I read your chapter, that yeah. he, he was head of the Green Party at the same time as being editor of the Journal of Climate. Yep. And we think yep. somehow the Journal of Climate is going to put forward things which uh, would say that Green's policies are an utter waste of time and expense. And in, in Yeah, well, I mean, one of the reviewers came back and said, uh, recommended against accepting the, the article because it seemed as though they were just trying to get something in the peer review literature that undermined the need for political action on the issue. You know, Again, I mean, like, the, it, like the quote yeah, <laughs> about well, Warwick Hughes, you know, why should I give you something that just yeah. might prove us wrong? So well, it, it is like the climate scientists have, have lost the plot for mo in, in most of the cases. I always see this as science being a brand name. And it's mm. a brand name that's a loophole because in, and you would know this from risk management, the, um, in all the other areas which matter and where billions of dollars depend on things, things like banking uh, and accounting, our tax audits, all those kinds of things, the, the standards of what we would expect are so much higher. I mean, no one would put up with getting their tax return audited by two pals that they nominated Mm -hmm. to read and 
anonymously and uh, unpaid. Uh, wouldn't that be nice if we could do our tax returns and <laughs> get yes. them accepted like that? Yeah. Uh, it, so it, it seems to me that science here is that people pretend that it's a very high standard and that the brand name of science, which was accrued through things like the Manhattan Project and the, the vaccination programs that saved lives through smallpox and whatnot, and then we're, they're riding on the coattails of all that, while actually underneath the, the driving engine here, there's, there's just mice running on wheels. It's almost nothing. Well, I mentioned uh, Popperian approaches to philosophy of how we test good science. Um, there's a, another philosopher of science, Paul Feyerabend, who says that, you know, never be any official science. Uh, science should be an anarchistic activity. People should be, you know, kind of having a go at each other. There should be no official science whatsoever. Uh, and, of course, the, the contrast, I suppose, is, uh, you know, the notion of a Kuhnian paradigm and so on dominating things until a better paradigm comes along. Now, that's a reasonable description of the way science often advances, but it's not a, it's not a model for measuring good science. You know, there are plenty of examples of Kuhnian paradigms that, that have protected an area of knowledge that turn out to be totally wrong. Um, and uh, you know all they all they are are sort of means of circling the wagons, uh, defending against uh, competing ideas until the paradigm collapses. So having a, the support of a large number of scientists is is no guarantee of quality uh, whatsoever. And of course, they worse than just being a bunch of scientists doing this, they have a political um, uh, carter that helps support that, who runs around and uh, attacks anyone like me or Garth Poultridge, anyone who dares to, uh, to raise a kind of sceptical voice, immediately gets labelled as a denier who is supposedly in the pay of fossil fuel interests or, or whatever. So it's that sort of, that, that junction, that, that union between activist scientists and political activists, environmental activists, that's particularly dangerous here because well, it yeah, means... There is there's a group pile on and a bullying that goes on and you documented some of that with the descriptions in the book of, uh, of quotes of how people were going to make sure that so-and-so never got published again or that they would yeah. make sure yeah. that all their papers were not accepted and they would even rule out entire journals because yeah. some of the journals had deemed to even publish some sceptics. Yeah, and then behind all of that, of course, you, you have the, the economic, the, those who benefit from this activity. And there are people like Michael Bloomberg who've grown really very rich. They've enhanced their billions by putting money into uh, the Sierra Club for its Beyond Coal campaign whilst investing in gas. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it, and of course, I mean, there's a former trade commissioner I, I know is a fellow of an institute that I'm also a fellow at called Bruce Yandel, who, uh, who came up with the model of a bootlegger and Baptist coalition. You've got the bootleggers who can't make money unless they can sell liquor on a Sunday. And then the Baptists who provide the moral argument and support for this and make it legitimate to funnel resources to the bootleggers. And so you have, you know, the likes of uh, uh, Bloomberg and Tom Steyer as, as hedge fund operators and Democratic Party presidential candidates uh, uh, this time around, um, then putting money into NGOs that further their interest. Uh, and everyone stands there with a warm inner glow thinking they're doing wonderful things to save the planet. Uh, you know, it's well, That's it's right, laughable. and I've documented many of the examples of where uh, nice, friendly, small companies like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Barclays Bank, HSBC, Deutsche Bank are all very, very keen to save the world. And, of course, they've got their own financial interests hoping to set up global carbon trading, which will be a yeah. market worth some estimates of $2 trillion. It'll be the largest commodity market in the world, they say, if we could only get international carbon trading going. Of course, there's no commodity. It's just yeah. paper certificates. It's, it's kind of like the vaporware. And but but so all, that all that masks the fact that there is, you know, there's an issue that governments need to take into account and, and respond to, but you get, they get pushed into bad policies and wrong directions. So, look, I mean, do you get depressed by this sometimes? Is it? Oh, yeah, but I, 
I sort of regard it all a bit as a, as a bit of an enthusiasm that eventually will pass. Uh, I just hope it doesn't do too much damage in the meantime. Um, you know, you look, uh, you look at uh, the next generation, uh, uh, not everyone is uh, uh, swallows all of this stuff. There are people, I'm actually pleased that my 21-year-old daughter um, is open-minded, but she's, you know, she's skeptical of lots of things. And, uh, and, and I see increasingly members of the young, you know, the next generation coming up who are um, genuinely open-minded and don't necessarily believe and, you know, make jokes about, uh, you know, the next way in which we're going to go to hell on a handcart. Uh, I think my generation particularly, I wrote an essay earlier this year on the prevalence of apocalypticism uh, that's about, that, uh, that came on particularly most evident, um, of course, with the Club of Rome and uh, in 1972, and I was a believer. As was I in my younger yes. days too, <laughs> no, helping I, the Greens, I, the Greenpeace, I, the Wilderness Society, yeah. and, and even raising funds for the Greens yeah. in uh, elections because, uh, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who could, who would disagree with saving the environment? You know, I've still got my, my first uh, Greenpeace badge from about 1973 somewhere, you know, when when nuclear testing in the Pacific was, mm. was all the go. And your chapter... I think reminded me so much of the big corruption issues we've had in climate science and the, the kind of shocking stories that came through the climate gate emails, the, uh, the way they've been forcing out the sceptics and doing everything in their power to stop them getting a, their message across. And, uh, and, and, for example, the Carl et al. example, how much science appears to be crafted to fit the deadlines of political meetings and the science being so dodgy. I mean, in your impression of, and for the people listening, the Carlito was a big paper that came out just in time to show the pause. The pause yeah. was gone. Yeah. We all yeah. knew it was there because we saw it in the uh, in the RSS, the UAH data sets. We saw it in the Hadley data set, the NCDC data set. We saw it in the ground. All, all of these data sets said there's been a pause. Mm. And then suddenly this paper appears yeah. saying, yeah. no, no, we were wrong. And it turns out that, you know, quality assurance had been skimped on. There was a whistleblower within the NOAA uh, in the US that pointed out that this had, this had been sort of rushed into print. And I thought it ironic that one of the arguments they used to kind of explain away the pause was that it started with an El Nino event. Uh, but then, of course, they're quite happy to take the 2014 uh, record El Nino as uh, as uh, part of the temperature record, and uh, uh, and uh, you know that that didn't affect things at all. Well, uh, yeah, El Nino is at the end of a pause are different to the ones at the start. Of course, they were. I mean, um, but yes, it's it's kind of interesting to see the, the kind of differential. Um, application of, of uh, scientific standards uh, yes you mean, uh, I mean hypocrisy you're just being polite about it <laughs> yeah i mean if you're if you are open-minded you look at the data uh, although that's increasingly difficult to find the raw data <laughs> um, I, I, I know than, as you pointed out earlier the, the enormous hadley set which is supposed to contain all of that data and it's gone yeah the original yeah. raw data just yeah. Uh, yeah, no one's kept it. They ran out of memory sticks. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. I mean, these things, of course, have you know massive um, memory requirements and so on. But they didn't seem to be you know put up a case for preserving the original data. Um, uh, I know in the social sciences, there's been a, an emphasis for thirty or forty years of of retaining and archiving data. Uh, as being significant and being important because... And, and of course, with medical know. data, I guess you're oh, yes. aware of how yeah. strictly yeah. they treat medical data, how you yeah. have to get permission to even play with the set and put out a yeah. different version, I think. I mean, someone else, you know, in, in future might want to come along and interrogate that data, but, you know, they might find it's already been tortured and tortured to death. Well, and that uh, is indeed yeah. what John McLean found, wasn't it? Yeah. The Australian yeah. researcher who went through the Hadley data set and discovered yeah. that there were ships in there that were 100 kilometres inland reporting sea surface temperatures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's really quite... Uh, 
comical if it wasn't so serious at, at, at times. And, uh, you know, the, the use, as we know, the Earth's surface is 70% covered by water. Uh, and so when we talk about the historical temperature record, we're not talking about um, air temperatures, recordings of air temperature. We're talking about temperature measured in the, in the, the top of the oceans and taken uh, at face value as, as being a good proxy for the temperature of the air above it. Now, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, there was some research um, a while ago that pointed out that you know, the correspondence wasn't wasn't quite perfect. I see. We, I mean, we could we could talk and go on at length about the corruption involved and the whole mindset of climate research. But what's the answer in terms of the incentives for scientists? How can we fix this system so that scientists are interested in the truth? rather than interested in finding reasons for the government to save us from a disaster which will generate larger grants? Oh, well, I think the, the important thing, again, I go back to Popper, I mean, you, you have to have diversity of views. You have to ensure that uh, policymaking is informed by uh, and takes into account views that aren't necessarily popular. I mean, we can... We can um, start insisting on certain standards uh, for scientific information. I mean, the US Supreme Court did this with the Daubert case, of course, and there've been a couple of subsequent cases uh, kind of uh, modifying and adapting that, saying out what counts as, as scientific evidence in court. And it's essentially a Popperian kind of uh, uh, set of standards. It has to be published in peer reviewed journals. It has to be falsifiable, you know, these sorts of things. And there have been a is few it, cases. Is it really necessary, the peer reviewed? Because we've got so many problems with peer review. Well, is yeah. there a way of getting around that with a more open publishing uh, yeah. where people have to put their data forward? Yes, I think, I think you're touching on, I was about to say that, you know, that assumes that peer review is, is good. And in 1973, when the Darwin decision was handed down, there was probably more faith in it, but you know John Yonidas at um, at Stanford, who's uh, done a lot of good work on uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, published a paper um, some years ago where he pointed out that something like fifty percent of research in medical research in medical journals turned out to be wrong. Um, now that's a fairly high, you know, given given the standards they must mm. adhere to, you know, with things like drug trials, where, you know, you have to have separate teams making up the doses and the placebos, and then p passing those to the people who administer them. They don't know which is which, uh, and then having a separate team uh, doing the diagnosis and a separate team uh, doing the statistical analysis. Even then to stop bias of various sorts creeping in. And we know from the psychology, from, from psychological science, that when people have strong beliefs, they can overlook things, they can exercise confirmation bias and so on. Now, if with all of those checks, half of medical science still turns out to be wrong, then you know that science generally has a problem. You need perhaps journals that, uh, dedicated journals that publish negative results that emphasize them, that will publish them, rather than just, you know, favor positive confirming results. Because confirmation is inviting confirmation bias. Yeah, I, I guess I yeah. see, I think what we need is some mix of public and private, which is different. We yeah. need uh, perhaps, and they've got to be totally separate and competing researchers yeah. rather than this kind of big club of 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 all government funded ones. Yeah. I don't know how we get private funding into research on the climate because so many private industries, as you pointed out before, have an interest in the scare yeah. that if they're funding the research, that's not going to be any better necessarily. Yeah. So I'm not sure how we go forward. Um, how, we, I mean, if the government set up deliberately a team, I've often wondered because at the moment, no one's job is to find holes in the theory. No yeah. one is paid, prove your worth by yeah. showing us how it's wrong. Yeah. Prove your worth by showing how it's the sun controlling yeah. the climate and not CO2. And without yeah. setting up this B team in a big way, yeah. 
and it needs funding. I mean, it, we've I've got so many people who send me research. To, I mean, these are scientists who, for fun and for the sheer thrill of discovery, are downloading NASA data and whatnot and analysing it and sending me things back. We know there's a drive there, but then there's no authority when they put their research out. They can't get published in standard peer review, uh, no matter how good the research is, because as you've shown in your chapter, there's no uh, official reports of the reviewers who are all handpicked anyway, yeah. where yeah. you can have a reasonable kind of review. So it seems like there's so many holes in this whole process. Mm-hmm. It's so shot through. Um, I'm finding it hard to imagine how we can sort this out unless the government is specifically funding journals itself, yeah. which will publish those negative results that you're yeah. pointing out. Yeah, um, yeah it, I guess we're left with that question. What do we do? The whole thing needs to be built back up from the ground again. Mm. Well, I think you can you know, go back to the old you know, red team, blue team model and perhaps have a public, publicly funded blue team uh, whose job it is is to do just that, is to, is to criticise, find faults, uh, see whether, see what stands up and what doesn't. Um, some of it will stand up. I mean, I don't think, despite the fact that, uh, you know, we're all deniers, um, which is a rhetorical device quite deliberately introduced uh, by those criticising Bjorn Lomborg back in 2001, and they're quite explicit. You know, they said, that, you know, anyone who questions the, the fact that 50,000 or 60,000 species are going extinct every year, which Extinction Rebellion have now picked up. It's a nonsense claim deriving from the species area model, which is nonsense, um, is like uh, uh, someone who denies that the Holocaust exists and asks you to name one victim, you know, to name the victims. Well, I think we've got fairly good evidence that uh, the Holocaust occurred. And I've, I've been to the... Uh, the Shoah Museum in Paris, where you know the card, the index cards are there with the people who were deported to, to camps and so on. Either either the uh, those faking it uh, went to extreme lengths to record the name and details of of millions of people, you know, who were victims of the Holocaust. Uh, we know, you know, we know uh, species that have gone extinct. There have been about eight hundred in the past five hundred years that are documented. Uh, that have actually existed outside of a computer model. Um, so if we, you know, if we can get a decent uh, institutionalized skepticism, then I think we're part of the way. And maybe things like publicly funded journals uh, uh, are useful. Um, I'm, and I say all that, but I've often, I have said on my blog, I think the best thing we could do for climate science was pull government funding completely. Because it seems mm-hmm. like the more they fund, the worse it gets. Yeah. yeah. So I'm open to suggestions on that too. Because <laughs> I, I actually think we would get more done if we left it entirely to volunteers and yeah. people funded by donors in the old original philosophical sense of science, which before the, you know, the, as Eisenhower warned, in that original era when science was philanthropy, it was funded by donors and someone had to convince a donor that they were doing something useful. Mm. That, uh, as a way of getting science done, it might work better than any government funding because, because it, it seems yeah, like the more the government funds in this, the worse we get. Yeah, and there are philanthropists who are prepared to make donations to pure research. Um, Indeed, you know, the thrill of discovery does live on. And, yeah, and yeah. But, you know, I mean, part of the problem, of course, is the necessity in the modern university of learn dedicated research research institutes to, to chase research funding. There was a medical uh, researcher at Monash, I think, uh, 10 years or so ago, worked out that the, the cost of it to an institution to, to apply for a, an ARC discovery grant was about $18,000. You know, that's the resources going into the application. For half that, I could have probably done you know, most of the research that I, that I did, but you have to load it up with possible PhD scholarships with uh, maybe, a, uh, maybe a postdoctoral fellow. Press uh, releases, papers, yeah. link, yeah. link, link, all that to kind of thing. Budget yes, large it's... enough, you know, to, to uh, get it to be a, a large enough grant and, and to, uh, to pad it out. And yet, you know, 
uh, it's not necessarily a successful model. As I no, say. and indeed the chapter after yours by um, Scott Hargraves and Paul McFadden and Bella de Brera, uh, sorry if I've got those names um, jiggled up, but they they were talking about the funding models of, of research and the way the government organises it and the fact that scientists used to be run on tenure yeah. and with that long-term kind of guarantee yeah. And now it's become every three years a grant and they spend one year of the three doing the grant and yeah. how unproductive yeah. a model that is. Yeah. And it also makes them, I guess, always these grant hunters. I think it's propelled a lot of researchers forward who are good at applying for grants, not yeah. necessarily the ones who are good at hunting for the truth. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've had a number of uh, ARC grants in my day, but, uh, you know, in the past few years I'm going to just shake my head at some of the things that are funded and some of, the, some of those that are not. So um, I think I mean, obviously we could talk for hours. Is we there could. any last thing you want to add about uh, yeah. problems in the world of science and the corruption going on or the worst incident you've I come Yeah, I don't think so. I, I should say when I – let me clarify that when I say corruption, I'm not talking about necessarily about venal corruption of people taking money uh, and so on, which happens – but this, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about it's more about the soft, the soft, corruption. noble cause corruption, the selling yeah. of our souls yeah. for and, better financial. And the mistakes that that leads to, you know, the the, the fallacies of argu argument and ad populum, you know, pointing to the vast numbers of people who who happen to subscribe to a particular point of view, which is a fallacious argument, as you know, various people like you know Einstein and. Others, uh, Galileo and others have, uh, uh, have shown, um, arguing from authority, um, confirmation bias, bringing evidence to the theory, bringing, looking around and finding some evidence that agrees with your theory doesn't actually prove anything. You know? uh, and you can't prove science. You can go out, identify what it is that would disprove it, that would falsify it, and then subject that to the test and look for evidence that, that would do it. Uh, and as Papa says, you know, uh, in the meantime, we hold to our views of science uh, tentatively, and we should always half expect that they might establish scientific theories might be proved wrong. Uh, you know, I mean, so it's not... Well, it's and not, that is the problem of the activist scientist, isn't it? Yeah. And, and uh, while I guess I'm not intrinsically against a scientist being an activist in the sense of if they really believe there's a problem, they should be able to say so. Yeah. But underneath it all, the most noble scientist, as you're pointing out, is the one who also says, I've tried to find errors with this. This is the, um, I tried to prove myself wrong. I tried to show this theory was wrong mm. and, and talking mm. about that falsifiability. There are some out there, but you know they're they're rarer than they should be. Yes, not so many left. Well, look, it's been lovely talking to you today. So thank you so much, and um, of course, highly recommend the chapter and the book, and mm -hmm. um, so people can go out and find out more about this in Climate Change: The Facts, and we um, for the 2020 edition, and hopefully we will um, talk to you again soon. Thank you, Joe. I hope you enjoyed that interview and I hope it has inspired you to pick up a copy of Climate Change, The Facts 2020. I cannot recommend the book enough. To watch the interviews in the series or to find out more about the book or to purchase a copy, head over to climatechangethefacts.org.au.